Welcome to Choose the Nickel. I am your host, George Bailey. My co-founder and technical support is the ever-talented, ever-beautiful Christina Bailey. This podcast is about giving kids financial freedom. My wife and I love our four children and want to learn to prepare them more effectively for the adult world. So we're interviewing fascinating people for their insights about how children learn to be financially savvy. Our guests come from diverse, sometimes conflicting schools of thought, and we love the opportunity to learn from them. We encourage listeners everywhere to weigh our guests' ideas on how best to cultivate in children a healthy relationship with money. We invite you to visit our blog at www.choosethenickel.com, subscribe to our newsletter, and explore our efforts to apply what we are learning on the podcast. For our second episode of Choose the Nickel, we are interviewing James E. Hughes, Jr. Mr. Hughes, a resident of Aspen, Colorado, is the author of Family Wealth, Keeping It in the Family, and Family, the Compact Among Generations. He has also co-authored several other books. Mr. Hughes has written numerous articles on family governance and wealth preservation and has been cited in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. He is a member of boards of various private trust companies, an advisor to numerous investment institutions, and a member of a number of private philanthropic boards. Mr. Hughes was educated at the Farbrook School and has attended the Pingree School, Princeton University, and the Columbia School of Law. He has won numerous awards for his work in family governance, and you will find a more complete biography about him in the show notes. I thoroughly enjoyed getting to know him for this podcast. Ladies and gentlemen... James Hughes Jr. Good morning, George. Good morning. How are you doing, Mr. Hughes? Fine. Yeah, please call me Jay. Great. Okay. Well, Jay, welcome to the show. Delighted to be here. <laughs> now, you are an attorney. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you practice uh, estate and succession planning, I assume. Well, you could call it that. I would prefer to call it private client work because I think private client work is a better term. What is it about that phrase that makes it better? When I was practicing law, the first half of my career, George, I did structures and wills and trusts and things that most lawyers do in that field. But I found in midlife that most of those structures – actually didn't work because the human beings for whom they were created could not make them function on their own. And that dependency seemed to me to be very dangerous. In fact, it was harmful. So I see private client work as not leaving structures out, but that they evolve out of what he or she feels they can actually manage themselves. Wow. That's a very different way of looking at it. And if I gather you correctly, would you say then that estate planning can become a little bit of an inhibition if they don't first put those relationships in order? Oh, I think absolutely. Um, I think it's actually life planning. Absolutely. The, the question of the capacity of the people on whom one is going to act with something is an enormous responsibility. If the people aren't really able to receive what we're going to give them, then we're harming them. So it, the, the planning process to me is the ongoing conversation about why one wants to do something. If we do know why we want to do it and we know on whom we want to act, then we have to do a lot of thinking about the consequences of, on that person of that action. So you don't just hand money over and say, okay, they're going to do the best thing for themselves that that money could possibly make happen. Well, you can, but what comes to mind, George, is the story in Alice in Wonderland when Alice is walking down the street and in the woods and there's the Cheshire cat sitting on the branch with a big smile. And he asks Alice, where are you going? And she said she doesn't, didn't know. And he said, then you were certain to get there. Obviously, uh, <laughs> no place she might actually want to have gotten. So, yeah, I think that the preparation is everything. The actual gift is simply a moment in time uh, when all those earlier actions come to fruition. 
Absolutely. And that makes such sense. I think that one of the things that I'm trying to do with this blog and podcast is to spread a message that's very similar. And that is that, look, you don't just raise your kids and hope that they turn out all right. You have to be very deliberate. You have to talk with them very directly about what it is you're giving them. If you're going to get them an education, that's great. But what is the purpose? And for you, you seem to be saying that the purpose is to make them happy. I would go beyond that to help them flourish. Mm, To help them flourish. Define flourish, please. Well, many of the great philosophers, it doesn't really matter where or when, have asked us the question that only the examined life is a life worth living. So I think people who are flourishing, as they do that examination, feel that they have found how to love, as Freud said, found how to work, vocation, as Freud said. And in some way, they've dealt well with gender and they've dealt well with money. Basically, or we could go back to Plato and Aristotle. We could go back to the Bible. We could go lots of resources. The examined life is the great life. And that and that doesn't mean we did everything in our lives that we intended or that we did them perfectly. But that we can say to ourselves, yes, this was good. You know, one of those, <laughs> one of those expressions that I often hear is like, I don't want to have any regrets. And I hear that and I kind of think to myself, well, you know, I got a couple, <laughs> you know, and things that I really <laughs> wish that I'd done better. But, you know, so would you say that you can have regrets and still have, you know, this life where you've, you've examined your own life and you, and you feel pretty good? Oh, absolutely. Um, Regrets are simply part of being a human being. Yeah. I I don't think one can possibly live a life without regret. It's baked in if you've actually lived as opposed to just been quietly trying to avoid every possible mistake. It's a wonderful cliche, but I I agree with you. I think that, look – uh, you have to learn to accept that you have made mistakes, sometimes major. I know that in my life I have made plenty of mistakes, both big and small. Uh, but I'm very grateful for that philosophical foundation that allows me to look back on my life and to be able to take the good and move forward with that. Now, in your book, you discuss the challenge of long-term wealth building in families, and you invoke the proverb of shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. Can you describe what that proverb means? The shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve proverb, our understanding of it begins by accepting that every culture on earth that we know about has had some form of this proverb. Clogs to clogs, rice paddy to rice paddy, uh, stable boy to stable boy. There, There are more ways of saying this than you can imagine. But it is culturally ubiquitous. And I know that's a great big word, but it simply means it's everywhere. <laughs> we're, we're good with big words here. Okay. We're good. It's, it's, okay. it's luckily, it's probably going to be the parents listening more than the kids. Okay. But, uh, you know, so okay. you use all those big words, throw them, you know, throw them this way. I love those. Okay. So. I didn't know that when I was four years old, and I heard my parents discussing this, Uh, my mother's father having gone bankrupt in the Depression, and she was tremendously aware of this proverb. Although he was the second generation by birth, he was the ninth of 11 children, and by the time he came, he was really a grandchild. So he, he was really third generation. And then I heard it again in Singapore in 1974, in the mouth, coming out of the mouth of a Chinese gentleman. And all of a sudden, I thought, oh, my goodness, this is very surprising. So for I spent a year or two, George, going around the world, either physically or reading or studying, and I kept finding this proverb everywhere. What does it mean? Well, there are probably two ways to understand it. One is very rational, and one is more complicated. But I'll take the rational one first. It means that someone in an act of enormous generativity takes energy, our universe is made up of energy as we know with only a tiny bit of matter, takes energy and makes it matter. Actually, human beings shouldn't be able to do that, but people do. So in our euphemism, we call that the first generation, even though there are thousands of generations. But let's say euphemistically, that's the first generation. That person creates what we think of as a fortune, that is matter, 
M-A-T-T-E-R, fortune. The second generation changes its clothing, goes to the university, lives someplace else, and lives a nice, a really lovely life, often working, but working not too well. And the third generation spends the fortune, and the fourth generation goes back to shirt sleeves or the rice paddy or wearing wooden shoes. The more interesting way, I think, to look at it is in this way from physics of all things this morning. Since the universe is made up of energy, and this energy in this proverb becomes matter, we then know from studying physics, and I mean very, very simple physics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank heavens. Don't go okay. down that path. You know, my, no. my father-in-law, I should tell you, is a computational nuclear physicist. So uh, if, if I don't get uh, this, he's going to translate this for me later, okay? But okay. I have, I'm that, nowhere near that. Okay. So, but I get the basics. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> so essentially, the rule in our universe is that whatever becomes matter will eventually go back to energy. Huh. Uh, we call that the law of entropy. Now, your father-in-law will say that's about as foolish a way to define it. <laughs> not hey, no pressure. But, He's not okay. judgmental. Okay. <laughs> it is sufficient for today. <laughs> <laughs> so the first generation takes energy and makes it matter. The second generation, that matter plateaus. And I'll come to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And in the third generation, the matter dissipates back to energy. That's essentially what's happening. Not to get ahead of us, but I do think it's interesting to realize that when we face that proverb, we are actually simply recognizing Mother Nature's rules, energy to matter to energy. Why am I stopping for a moment and pausing and saying, aha, let's think about it a little dif more deeply, is this. That rule in our universe is immutable. It's always going to happen. So Mother Nature says to a family or any other organism, you will be energy, you will be matter, and then you will be energy again. So she says that will happen. Here's the key word. She never says when mm. it will happen. So great families, as we'll discuss on this morning, understand that you can't avoid that proverb. But you can decide in your family when it will happen. And that could be 20 generations from now. Every generation is the first in its own way. It's creative, regenerative, or not. Every generation faces the silent question of the second generation, which we're going to talk about next. Every generation faces the question of dissipation, except if you never leave the second generation, you never get to the third. So if every generation thinks of itself not only as the first being generative, but the second being generative, ah, George, then you can go a very long way. So the when and will question is very delicate, but very, very important. So let me pose this question then. You know, my takeaway has been that each of us, if we're going to make the most out of building a family legacy, will encourage the next generation to forge its own legacy, become a first-generation mentality. Mm -hmm. And what if, though, in a family you have, you know, one person who's first-generation-minded and a they marry a person who's third-generation-minded? <laughs> I'm going to shake it up for you. I just – I really right. want to pick your brain. I've been thinking about this question because it's – yeah, and I want to see what your answer is. This is a wonderful question. And, of course, we can marry any kind of – a different person than we are ourselves. We usually do. And yeah. then we have to figure out uh, how to negotiate those differences. I think the key question is finding what it is that we are meant to do in this lifetime and get about doing it. So the first generation person uh, may say, not he or she will build a business or he or she will paint a great painting, but the generative process of the first generation is discovering, as Freud said, how to love and how to work, hmm. finding vocation. And so it's easy to think of the first generation as making a fortune. I don't think of it that way. I think of the first generation as someone who makes an enormous contribution in the world. That's the generative aspect. Now, 
someone in the third generation, in the way we're talking about it, who is committed to dissipating whatever that is, is going to be in an enormous conflict because dissipation doesn't mean the thing goes away as we normally think about it. It just stops being matter and starts becoming energy again. Now, sometimes that's actually a very good thing. Sometimes the, the, the matter just ought to go back into the pool, so to speak. <laughs> and so I think what they're going to have to find, and this is a, an answer obviously off the top of my head because it's a wonderful question, but I have thought about it. Oh, I came prepared. <laughs> okay. Let me <laughs> – yes, you did. Let's look for a moment at the second generation. The second generation is usually silent. Hmm, the listeners think, what does he mean by silent? Well, the first generation is very noisy. So you could go to a bookstore and buy a copy of Ron Charnow's Titan, which is the story of the life of John D. Rockefeller Sr., and and find out what one of the greatest first generation wealth creators of all time, who he was. How did he live his life? What was his purpose? Then you could go to the self-help section of the same bookstore and find volumes on the third generation's dissipation process. But I would tell you that finding a book on a second generation person, you can't find that book. The second generation is silent. It grows up in the vortex of this immense creativity by the first generation. And so no one really much cares about it. It's, it sounds like the middle child. It is exactly <laughs> the middle child. Well, I've got said. siblings who are just, you know, they, they're, they're concurring right now. So, right. <laughs> but okay. I wouldn't call them silent. So. Oh, okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Ignored maybe, but not silent. <laughs> However, the second generation has a very peculiar task. It's the first generation, and I'm using words very carefully, that really cares about family. The first generation, by and large, is absorbed in the immensity of the dream that is enabling it to take energy, a dream, and make it matter. The second generation comes to life in the vortex of that dream, in the surrounding of that dream, and it has to discover its own way of making choices, and it's got to discover its own path. Great families grow great second generations. That's a key that almost no one focuses on or knows. Now, why am I raising it in the context of your the juxtaposition of a first and third couple? They're probably going to have to find the balance that the second generation represents. Second generation isn't without new energy. It is accreting energy, and it is going to have some dissipating of energy. It's great art is to discover the place of just into chaos, just into creativity, along with the order necessary to maintain that works. So if that couple is lucky and figures out that their task is to become a kind of second generation process, a kind of second generation couple, then they're both going to win. There will be some spending and there will be some accretion. And just hopefully just a little more accretion than the spending. And all of a sudden, like the J or the hockey stick, everything looks fine. You mentioned in your book, you know, it, just as long as you get it a little bit more right than the previous generation, you're probably moving in that right direction. But let's say that a family does find itself in that second generation state of stasis. That is that they are doing yes. fine because their parents did fine. What dangers do they risk at this point? And how would you, uh, how, how can they adopt that first generation mentality? And, and, and of course you mentioned earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to discard the second generation yearning for that healthy family, but what is the danger and how do they adopt that wealth building or that first generation mentality? Let's start with stasis. There's an old saying that the universe abhors a vacuum. Stasis, for the, those who are listening, is kind of like a vacuum. It's just nothing happening. There's lots of motion, but nothing happening. Stasis is not ever, in fact, there. You're either growing and evolving or you're not. 
So stasis is the beginning of the end of anything in the sense of the of a continuation. It's a state in which energy is not being accreted. It's not being added to. What I have said to second generation is people for years and years, and actually most of my clients were second and are second generation because I've been much less interested, George, in what most of my colleagues are interested in, the wealth creator. I'm much more interested in the family, and the family starts in the second generation. That's where the compact has to begin Are we going to give up freedom by agreeing to help each other and hoping that you'll help me? That's the core long, long long-term question of any human group. So when the second generation feels stasis and is aware that it's in stasis, that which is an incredibly important place to be, and say, we're in danger here. I see what Jay and George are saying. We're in danger. We plateaued. Then I ask them this core question. Are you prepared to discover what in this lifetime is your work? Now, I do not mean work by as labor, although that's very fine work. I mean work as vocation. There's a Latin word vocare as opposed to labore. These two words sound in English very much as they did in Latin. So I asked them, well, what is your work in this world? What is your vocation? What is your dream? And they say, well, I don't have a dream. I'm having to steward this thing that somebody else created. And I'd say, well, well, maybe, but it might surprise you, second generation person, that I never have met anyone in the world who doesn't have a dream, even people picking garbage in Kenya in a certain sense. And they look at me in disbelief and they say, what, really? And I say, yeah, you have a dream. And then 40 and 50 year old people, George, cry. And I hold them. I'm happy to be there with them because they then say to me, and these families, frankly, of immense matter, wealth, financial wealth, not one person ever asked me that question. Wow. If If our listeners think about their own lives, the lives of those of our listeners, and I hope every one of them are flourishing, I can almost assure them and assure you That someone, when they were eight or nine, and then again when they were 14 or 15, who they really trusted not to have an opinion, asked them, what's your dream? When I asked first-generation wealth creators, when they're in their 60s, the first thing I asked them is, when did you have this dream? And they always tell me, sometime in their teens. And then I say, well, how did you bring it to life? And they always tell me that they had a mentor. I'm not drifting off on you need a mentor. No, they start telling me who it was with whom they had that conversation that gave them confidence and courage to try. Wow. The second generation is always able to awaken, just as we know in all spiritual traditions. Awakening is always there for us. And preparation, however, can be very useful. <laughs> <laughs> Awakening on a, on a strong foundation, I would say. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But and in the best sense, it matters that someone comes and asks us what is our dream, who we hear as not having a connection to our answer. That's really important. By the way, aunts and uncles in most of society were the ones who did this. But this has become so difficult in modernity. One of the most important relationships historically for human beings has been aunts and uncles. The second generation can get out of stasis if it then will act, George, on what it announces to itself its dream is. And it can be a very, very tiny dream. You know, people say to me, well, my father did so-and-so, my mother did so-and-so, or my grandfather did that and that. I said, so what? That's lovely. But what, what's your dream? Well, it's kind of a little dream. I said, no, no, there are no little dreams. Who are you? Yeah. Who are well, you? And, and, I, and I like that perspective of looking, at looking at things because if there are no little dreams, it would be explained by the fact that that little desire, so-called, goes to the core of who that person is. And that is important. And when they have that self-assurance, when they have that self-assurance that it is important, that they are important. And that is the absolute key. And in a book I wrote with uh, Keith Whitaker and Susan Masenzio, the image we have 
is a huge black hole of the dream of the first generation because that's what it collapses into when that generation goes away, an enormous vortex. And then we have a little tiny stick figure that's the second generation standing adjacent to that. And the question that we ask in the book is, can you live apart from it? Can you find people who will protect you to help you grow next to it? So when you get to be big enough, you can stand next to it safely and steward it, but not be sucked into it. Nice. That is a huge question for the second generation. Wow. And I expect that, you know, there are many people of my listeners who will be that second generation. Well, bless uh, them and tell them it's okay. They have, <laughs> they have a job to do, but it's growing up themselves. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, you know, it, so, you know, your, your book itself, I'm holding it here. Family wealth, keeping it in yes. the family. I, by the time that I discovered this book, I had already set out to start this process. I'm going to do a blog. I'm going to do a podcast. I'm, I'm going to really, you know, stump for this issue of uh, financial literacy, getting kids to learn about business and entrepreneurship. And then uh, some of our friends came over, uh, the Gradens, and they were, they were staying at our house, and we were talking about this. He's like, "Well, you should read this book," and he had oh my it. he had it on him. And he gave me, oh my he, gosh. he gave me this book. <laughs> so Brian Graydon, and I know you're listening. Thank you very much. And so thank I, you, I, ju- yeah, I jumped on it. I jumped on it, uh, very fast because I thought, Amazing. oh my gosh, this has got to be it. And so I read mm-hmm. through it and, you know, I always tr- turn on my, my skeptical mind when I go through something like that. So it's not like I just thought, well, he's talking about the same thing as, as me. Therefore he must be right. I just felt like, you know, I can't debate with this guy. He's really, really thought it through. And one of the things that you said that put things in perspective for me, because here I am focusing on teaching kids how to deal with money. You said that, well, families that get too much, too caught up on intellectual, on uh, financial capital will miss out on human and intellectual capital. Can you tell us what those things are? Because this was a game changer for me. I really, this was really nice. I think these are timeless ideas. That's what I was attempting to write. But I'm going to start from a slightly different perspective and then come right to the definition of these. We're living in a world in which intangible capital is overtaking tangible capital in any large organization we know. Amazon is made up of servers. It's a virtual company. It has almost no tangible assets nor does Google. What it has is incredibly bright human capital, incredibly bright intellectual people, and then combining that human and intellectual, it's all virtual, it's all intangible, into social capital, which means making good decisions, surrounded by spiritual capital, which is its dream. It's It's dream in the sense of what brings those people, those human beings, their intellectual selves, their willingness to make decisions together. It actually has a lot of money, but the money's actually pretty much irrelevant. It just provides people with some incentive to come to the office, but it's not the financial capital of the 70s and 80s, the manipulation of which was the core of corporate life and government life. Now, I'm saying that because for some of our listeners, the intangible asset question helps us move to the fact that families are basically made up of qualitative capital, not quantitative capital. So when I wrote Family Wealth, I was seeking to help families understand that they are made up of qualitative capital, not quantitative capital. Even today, George, that is an incredible barrier to families having a seven-generation plan or succeeding past the third generation. They cannot see that they are made up of themselves, the human beings who are who have affinity, who have a common interest in each other. So the human capital I'm talking about is a question of, is this human asset on the balance sheet of this family a thriving, flourishing human being? That's what I mean by human capital or whatever lesser than fr- than thriving, than flourishing they may be experiencing. Intellectual capital is what each person 
who makes up the family balance sheet knows. Is it a learning system? I don't care what your degrees are. I need to know, are you a learning system? Is everybody in that family who's on the family balance sheet seeing him or herself as a learning system? And are they sharing what they're learning? Enabling that group of people to grow social capital. Now, social capital often raises in the mind of people philanthropy, some action out to externally. It is that, but I'm speaking of it in a different way. I'm speaking of social capital as joint decision-making by this group that calls itself a family. Because the essence of a long, long journey is, as you said earlier, a series of slightly better decisions compounding over hundreds of years, rather than a series of less good decisions, not even bad ones, but ones that put you into stasis, as you said a little earlier. So is that decision-making system, that combination of the human capital and the intellectual capital and the social capital, is it creating dynamic decisions, decisions that have an energetic growth factor. And then the fourth qualitative capital, most important of all, is spiritual capital. And that means, do you have a common interest as pilgrims on the road to Canterbury, to all get to Canterbury together? Even though you have very individual goals and individual work, do you all want to see every boat in that family rise so everyone gets as Chaucer said, to Canterbury or to Santiago or to Mount Kailash or wherever it is in the world that your culture seeks in its journey to go. And in this case, where do I mean? I mean, can you say seven generations from today starting that we can look back and see all those decisions, each of those flourishing people, each of that combine intellectual capital into a decision-making system that enables human flourishing, enabled all the boats to rise, gets us to where we want to go, and then we can have the next journey. Now, let me say I am not silly, I hope, about quantitative capital. The words I'm using, financial capital, quantitative, what it can do is support that journey. It cannot make the journey. It's just an object that defines some value, but it has no intrinsic self. It's something we barter. So for those who like hand gestures, and this is not in Family Wealth because I hadn't thought of it when I wrote Family Wealth, I'm going to ask your readers to take their right hands, turn them facing horizontally with their thumbs up, and wiggle their thumbs. And as they wiggle their thumbs, they're going to find that their other four fingers close into their fist. I'm doing this, by the way. (laughs) That's right. It's impossible not to. Now, that thumb that is sticking up is financial capital. Ah, Your ah. first finger is human. Your second finger, intellectual. Your third, social. And your fourth, spiritual. Every family that has its thumb sticking up and the others disappeared is done. Wow. They're finished. It's over. Now, if you turn that hand upside down, and now your thumb is pointing down and your four fingers are pointing out. This feels very comfortable. You don't want to close them. Look what happened. Spiritual capital went on top. <laughs> oh, do we have a common vision of a long journey? Social capital, can we make good decisions? Intellectual capital, are we a learning system? Human beings, are we thriving, supported by the financial Nice. Yeah, I can see it. Now, just to describe this for the listeners, I'm watching this and it's very fun. If I put my thumb up and my hand out, my fingers out, then I wiggle my thumb and my fingers inevitably come back in. It's just natural. Uh, you can fight that, but you're fighting it. And then the other way, of course, is that I'm, I've got my hand with my thumb down, my hand out, and I'm wiggling it and, and it, it feels like it's all working together much better. Now, now what about you as a kid? Tell me a little bit about that. Where did you grow up? My parents were living in New York City, so I stayed there till I was uh, five and a half, and then we moved to New Jersey to a little town called Chatham, 
I lived there. I went to um, a wonderful progressive school that taught through the arts called Farbrook School. Then I went to a country day school called the Pingree School. And then I went to the Princeton University to college. And then I went to the Columbia University Law School. I practiced law in New York City. I stayed in that area until my first marriage ended in 1991. But where did I grow up, which is none of those things, actually. Every summer, uh, George, we went to a little cottage that my grandfather built in 1923. And I mean little. When people on the East Coast say they have a little cottage, uh, people all of a sudden think of an Adirondack camp. Yeah. No. <laughs> this is a, this it was is a very small <laughs> a very small house built on locust poles, strakes and shakes, no heat, and we summered there, and it was absolutely where I grew up and where I became who I am. Why is that? What was it about that little cottage that defined your childhood? We were part of 60 families on two roads, all contained, and a beach. It's a tidal beach in the off of the Long Island Sound, so the gets clean every six hours in and out. And in that creek was everything nature had offered to the Native Americans who had actually been living there. And there were middens, uh, uh, groups of their oyster shells and clam shells that went back thousands of years. And my brother and I, by the time we were, I don't know, eight, six, nine, seven, something like that, we began to have clamming businesses, which which meant at low tide, we went down with our feet and dredged clams, or we dug them off the beach. We had a crabbing business, and we had a little rowboat that we saved our money. We actually saved our money and bought so we could go catch crabs. Uh, we caught fish. Uh, we played softball on Sunday. It It was an idyllic late 1940s and 1950s existence, and we weren't afraid. We just were out having fun with our friends. It was a, an amazing time. And I, ever since the 60s and then the, all the decades since, we've had to understand uh, how different uh, life actually really is. But it was marvelous. And I could read. And the other place that I mentioned, the Farbrook School, where, we, where obviously I went nine months of the year, which taught through the arts – is the place I was educated. And people who read Family Wealth or any of the other books I've written will see that when on the back cover, when it describes me, it says I was educated at the Farbrook School and attended these fancy places. I wrote that intentionally. Being enabled to go to a school where all of the courses included the fine and performing arts was a gift for my parents of inestimable importance. So that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so I imagine that uh, going back to this cottage, that that uh, gave space in your life for a little bit of mischief. What can you legally tell me is your most mischievous <laughs> experience? You're like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I think that it was that once I got my bike and I had a, a pretty good bike when I was probably 13. Yes, I got a good bike when I was 13. I was then free well past curfew <laughs> to be on my bike, dry, riding around and really doing some mischievous things in the evenings. That uh, it was just incredibly fun. And that that's when I found out who I was, because some of those things were discovered. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. I like what were they? <laughs> you're, you're not giving me specifics, okay? We got it. <laughs> oh, I don't know. This, but the the kind of things that kids do, and um, oh, that's funny. I'm I'm thinking of. Um, well, I'll tell you one that's mischievous. It isn't bad, but it, it's kind of. A, oh, it doesn't a, have to be bad. A, no, that's some of the best in, kind of mischief. It's kind of a look into me that I think might be fun. When I was uh, 15 years old in this cottage area, some of the boys wanted to play Little League baseball, uh, hardball. We had a softball game every Saturday with the fathers and the sons, and, but they wanted to play hardball, and they needed a coach. And there wasn't anybody. The dads were all going off to work every day. There wasn't anybody to coach. So I said, well, I'll coach. And it was a police athletic league so I called up my, – my voice had changed, which was thank goodness and for this <laughs> story. And I called the police station that was in charge of this, and I said, 
are you interested in another team? And one from the 10 to 12s and one from the 13 to 15. And the police officer, oh, yes, we're, we're most, that's our business. We, we want more teams. That'd be great. I said, well, uh, okay, this is where I am. And uh, he said, great, I'll come over on Sunday and bring you the bats and the balls and the bases and uh, you, you can have a team. So, I don't know, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, this uh, car pulls up. Not a police car, but a nice sedan. And this very nice man gets out. And my mother and I come out of our little cottage and we're standing there. And uh, this nice policeman says to my mother, well, I'd like to meet Mr. Hughes because we, we – and my mother says, well, he's standing right here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. The policeman said, really? <laughs> Can you drive? I said, no. <laughs> Being the guy he was, I, I, I've often wondered what he, why he didn't just drive away, but he gave me the bats and the balls and the bases, yes. and we played. Uh, and I didn't drive; we had to get the moms to get all the kids. But it, you know, it was that kind of a place, George. Yeah. You, you could do. I mean, who could imagine that today? Oh, I, I know, I know, and, and you know, I look forward to this summer. And it's going to be different for my kids than it would have been for you. Now, thankfully, you know, we're going to be taking them swimming a lot and we will give them room for mischief and whatnot. But I think that that period of discovery is uh, very important. And uh, I don't know, you know, going back now, you've talked about dreams a little bit. Yes. And you have a family that is uh, multi-generational attorneys. Is that right? That is correct. D- would you say that some of your dreams were formed early on during those days? Yes. Let me say what part of that dream was, because I think dreams are not just the kind of forward, ineffable things that we think of when we see movies and read books. I didn't really know my father very well in my up to my high school years. I knew him. He came home every night, but he was always with a very large briefcase, very, very busy running one of the great law firms of the world. And I really didn't know him very well. So as I got toward college, I began to form a dream that I would like to work with him, find out who he is. This was very much my dream. So I ended up getting to law school, and I ended up going to work one summer in the law firm that he was the head of. And we began to ride then that summer on the train home to uh, this little cottage. And then I went to work in that law firm. And I went into the private client department. He ran the commercial department. But we began a 19-year professional association, which then continued after he retired for another 10 years. And he was the best teacher I ever had. Yeah. So my dream was to know who he was. I like that because, again, it goes to the core of who you are. Uh, it goes to kind of, you know, creating and scaffolding your own identity. And, and I think that that is important. I like that. It's taken me a while to kind of discover my own dreams. And I, I look back on my childhood and think like, you know, I certainly did not see myself then doing what I am now, but I do think that I had an idea then of how important my family should be and would become to me. And I find that very beautiful. Tell me a little bit about your favorite charitable cause. We always end the show with a little bit of discussion on a philanthropic cause, something you really love. Thank you, George. One day in 1986, I was driving down the road. The radio was on. Two people were being interviewed, a Mr. Risley and a Miss, Miss Hart. And they were talking about a book they wrote called Meaningful Differences. And in this book, they were describing a situation that I had never heard of or imagined before, and that is that language, how many words literally your mother speaks to you between the ages of zero and three, have everything to do with the rest of your academic life, and maybe then the rest of your life. And they were explaining that moms in poverty spoke 750 words a day to their children, many of which were uh, single syllable words, no sit, very uncomplicated yeah. words. I, I can imagine a child, a mother saying no to a child about 750 times a day. Okay. So yeah, this makes sense. Working class moms spoke 1200 words a day and privileged class moms spent, spoke 2500 to 3000. Wow. 
Every word a child hears from the moment it's born, maybe even prenatally, that's an open question, creates a brain synapse, a connection. These children of poverty, by the time they reach the age of three, are 30 million word deficit. Wow. I always wanted to find a way to help with that problem. And so I have been very blessed at this late stage of my life with a wonderful philanthropist who is a great friend and partner to work very actively with major academic institutions at one level on the science and major on the ground individuals who actually go into the homes of the mothers and help them learn how important it is to speak to their babies. And the results are staggering. Now, the interesting thing about it, and I'll end it this way, is that most of the focus for people in poverty has been on the tragic, toxic issues of the mothers. My partner and I realized that we could help the mothers, but first we had to help the child because the child's 80-year life trajectory depended absolutely on those brain synapses being created, those connections. And so we focus on the child and the mother's lives get better. Once she understands what this is about, and you see this child a year and a half later, this child is speaking to his mother with great big words. <laughs> but that, Kids are smart. So, Kids are smart. Um, having smart. Uh, having a, a background in foreign language acquisition, I can tell you that that's the time right there, that amazing things are happening in those little brains. So you know. moms or anyone who's listening, make sure that you're talking to that child from the day he or she is born and that any other moms you know, no matter where their stages of life, that they know that talking to their babies is the critical component to that baby being able to learn for the rest of his or her life. Jay, I can't thank you enough for coming on this show. It's been a wonderful pleasure to, t to talk with you. Thank you so much for your time. It's been my privilege, George, and I hope it happens again. Namaste and take good care. Absolutely. You too. Everybody else, thank you for listening. We hoped you enjoyed the interview and found useful ideas about things you can do with your kids. Be sure to check the show notes at www.choosethenickel.com for links to names, books, and other resources we discussed in today's show. Also, please subscribe to our newsletter and visit our contact page where you can give us feedback. We invite you to share Choose the Nickel with your friends and join us in our quest to give kids financial freedom.